Hey guys, welcome to Test Tube Plus. I'm Trace. We wanted to do a special series on addiction here on Test Tube Plus, and today's episode is super exciting. I asked my good friend, biological anthropologist and primatologist Natalia Reagan to jump into the host seat because she is uniquely qualified to talk about all things addiction. So I'm gonna leave it to her. I hope you enjoy it. Hey all, welcome to Test Tube Plus, I'm Natalia. I'm dropping in to do a couple episodes on addiction. Uh, it's a heavy subject, but it's very important. And yesterday we talked about what exactly is addiction, and today we're gonna talk about how you can possibly beat addiction with treatment. So how do you treat addiction? Well, the most famous place to go when you're an addict is Alcoholics Anonymous. And how did that start? Well, 80 years ago, Bill W. and Dr. Bob formed Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill W. was working on Wall Street and doing great until he realized his life was unmanageable because of alcohol. And so he ended up going to the Oxford Group, which was a non-denominational church who had four tenets that really resonated with him. They were honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. And so he started Alcoholics Anonymous. And something to note is alcoholism, uh, which is called either an illness or a disease is the only disease that has to be self-diagnosed in order for you to even start treatment. You have to admit that you have a problem. You have to admit that you are powerless when it comes to drugs and alcohol. And so Dr. Bob and, and Bill W. started Alcoholics Anonymous and they have 12 steps and these steps are uh, followed by anybody who is part of the 12-step program and a, a big part of the 12 steps is about uh, again being honest and the first step is all about admitting that you are powerless again over substances. So Alcoholics Anonymous really encourages being honest with yourself and kind of shedding that ego and then serving others. So it's all about service in the end. In fact the last step is all about going out and sharing the knowledge that you have learned in the program. And what are the pros about AA? Well, I mean, there's a pro of being 100% honest with yourself. A lot of people are not honest with themselves at all. Let's let's face it, a lot of times we walk around kind of in denial about a lot of our uh, either attributes or our decisions in life. We, we don't want to own up to who we really are. And with Alcoholics Anonymous, being self-aware is a key aspect to it. Um, and I feel like everybody can benefit from the 12 steps. I've talked to a lot of people in the program and, and they definitely feel like uh, everybody could work a pro program, even the quote unquote normies, which are the, those that are not addicted to substances. So one of the cons could be considered the inclusion of God. For some, not everybody has a problem with that, but for those agnostics or atheists, um, the inclusion of a higher power is unsettling. And some people think that that takes away the accountability of one's actions. If we're saying that it all has to do with a higher power, how are we not being accountable? Well, there's this idea that you can actually supplement God with, you know, you can. It could be interchangeable with nature, some a tree, uh, friends, loved ones. It, it does not have to be a, a guy in a robe up in the sky. And another con is a lot of people say that addiction's not binary. You're not either a, a junkie or a normie. You're not necessarily an alcoholic or somebody who is completely fine. There is a moderation management group that you can join that teaches you how to basically manage your drinking. And another important aspect of, of AA is uh, sponsors. So a sponsor, like many of you probably know, is somebody that kind of helps you along, that has some time under their belt. And the pro of a sponsor is they keep you in check. You know, you can call them in the middle of the night. They can kind of, you know, help you lead you on a good path. The con is sometimes sponsors aren't the best. It's kind of like dating. You know, you got to find that perfect sponsor. You know they're too pushy, doesn't work. If they're too much of a, you know, a pushover, then it doesn't work either. So, but then there are those sponsors that are considered too self-righteous. They almost kind of think of themselves as God or the center of the universe and you should do exactly what you tell them. And they work their own program almost through you. And that brings me to a conversation I had with um, an addiction specialist and a punk rock hero. His name is Jack Grisham. He is not only the lead singer of uh, TSOL, but he also has 26 years under his belt of sobriety. And he has a new book coming out next week called A Principle of Recovery, where he talks about his own program that he works. Jack and I talked a little bit about sponsorship. We also talked about God because I asked him, well, how does God work in the program if you don't believe in God? Because I thought, you know, he'd be a great person to ask. Uh, he's worked with tons of uh, rock and rollers and, and, and probably has dealt with people that may or may not have believed in God. And he says, you know, God doesn't have to be a guy in the sky. Uh, and in fact, in his world, uh, he does not necessarily have 
a higher power that is God, he looks at God's attributes, which in his words are intelligence, spirit, soul, love, and service. Jack Grisham, that man is all about service, which I think is is wonderful. And, and he really, I feel like, embodies um, the spirit of um, giving back to a community uh, that, that is hurting. Uh, he also talks about the fourth step's importance and about how being self-aware, because the fourth step is really about taking inventory of, of who you are and, and bettering yourself. And if you have attributes, it's like being judgmental or being cruel or jealous. It's about scrubbing that away and making yourself a better person. And again, in that process, you can better serve people. He also talks about how steps 10, 11, and 12 kind of work together. Uh, step 10 is about kind of cleaning up, in his words. Uh, step 11 is about becoming, again, more self-aware. And step 12 is about sharing what you've learned and being of service to others. So uh, AA, it's almost as if it sounds to me, in my own interpretation, and this is my own interpretation, it's almost like exchanging one addiction uh, that is detrimental to your well-being to being almost addicted to, to helping people and to being a better person, which at the end of the day, I don't know, it sounds like a, a great thing to do, a great way to be. Um, but again, in the end, Jack said that connection and service were key. In fact, a lot of what he said calls back to Johan Hari's book about connection and, and connecting, connecting, connecting. And that human connection is what really pulls people out of the disease. It probably can send them into the disease just as much as it can pull them out. Because if you don't have any connection in your life and you're isolated and alone, it's easy to get lost in addiction, whether it's you know sex, gambling, alcohol, cocaine. But just like that can send you into a tailspin, it can pull you back out when you have a connection with a, a good human being that wants to serve and, and be kind to you. We also talked about you know the importance of, um, of, of treatment, um, not just AA. Um, there's impatient and sober living. So for instance, if you have a, a problem and, and maybe going to a meeting doesn't cut it, you might go impatient. And if you've seen that Sandra Bullock movie, 28 Days, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and it's just basically teaching you new life skills, a new way of living. I actually, when I was about 10 years ago, I worked at a rehab for adolescents. It was right after my accident and could barely kind of walk. I had a leg brace. And um, I remember, you know, thinking, how the heck did I get here? Uh, this wasn't the path I was, I was intending. And I met so many great kids because it was a rehab for adolescents. It was kids between the ages of 15 and 19. And just seeing the spirit that they had and, and watching them transform over, over time and learning new life skills to make them uh, connected and well-balanced adults was a, was a beautiful thing. Um, so after inpatient, um, usually it can be 28 days, it could be six months, it could be nine months, it can vary. Uh, Afterwards, you could either be thrusted out into the world, left to fend for yourselves, or you could possibly go to sober living. And sober living is living in a house. Gender, generally, it's gender specific. All males in one house, all females in another. You have a curfew, you have chores. You uh, generally have to have a job. They want to basically um, teach people how to live in a way without substance abuse. Um, and that generally includes you know, drug testing and things like that. So that's also a, a great way to maintain sobriety after getting sober in inpatient treatment. There's also an idea that, again, like I said, mental illness oftentimes uh, occurs alongside addiction, whether it's uh, a depression, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. And Cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, is oftentimes used with um, these disorders, including uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. It's very similar to addiction because you obsess over something, whether it's the, you know shopping, I need to have those shoes, and then you have that compulsive behavior, right? You buy those sho shoes even though you knew that you didn't have the money, and oh crap, I'm stuck with these shoes. So studies have shown that CBT has been effective in, in uh, treating co-occurring addiction and depression because basically it's a type of treatment that focuses on examining your thoughts and feelings leading up to a behavior and having uh, the ability to change those thoughts and feelings, alter them so you do not engage in that behavior. Or sometimes you substitute, substitute one behavior for another. Um, and that's something that can be very effective for those uh, going through, uh, you know, either withdrawals or uh, they always joke that, you know, sit on your hands. If you go to meetings, they'll tell you, you know, like just sit on your hands when you want to drink. Um, just kind of exchanging behavior um, to help you know, people curb those uh, uh, cravings. There's an idea that actually drugs can help curb alcohol and uh, addiction. Uh, there is Camprol, which is a drug that is supposed to curb the... Um, 
the craving of alcohol. Uh, now, that's not to say it cures addiction, because it doesn't. It, it's generally prescribed in, uh, again, in, con in concurrence with uh, a treatment program. So they're not just going to give you Camprol and be like, good luck. They want to know that you're actually actively going to treatment, whether it's uh, meetings or working with a sponsor or doing some sort of, um, working some sort of program. Uh, there's also Welbutrin, which is used oftentimes with trying to beat nicotine addiction, and it's found to be very effective. And Welbutrin also works well with, uh, with depression, which shows you how closely related addiction and depression are. So there's another example. Um, then there's a drug called Anabuse, which works by basically inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down the toxin, uh, acetaldehyde, in uh, alcohol. So when you drink alcohol, there's a toxin produced. Because let's face it, guys, when you're drinking, you're actually drinking poison. It makes you feel good to an extent until you drink too much. But when you first drink, your body actually has an enzyme to break down the acetaldehyde into acetate. And then it can be filtered out of your system through your urine. But this particular drug acts uh, as a, um, basically, it stops that process. And so immediately after you drink, you feel like you're hungover. Like you are immediately sick. And the problem is, sometimes people get prescribed that and they're so, well, so addicted, they still drink and they get sick. They get really, really sick. These drugs deal with the physical. They're not really dealing with your head and heart, which are very important when dealing with addiction. Because as we talked about, it's not just uh, a physical addiction. There's there's more to it. There's the environment and there's exposure. So um, these drugs are helpful, but you need more. In fact, when I talked to Jack, I asked them, hey, you know, if you could have a pill that would cure your alcoholism, uh, would you take it? And, and Jack laughed and he said, you know what? They'd have to give me three pills. And I said, okay, what, what would they have to be? And he said, you know, one of them would have to help with the cravings, you know, like Camprol. Um, one of them would have to be mm, like peyote, something that made him feel spiritual. And the third one would have to be something like Valium so he could not freak out because of the, the stress and sanity of, of life. Because the program that he has now and is working now fulfills all his needs. And that one pill could not possibly do that. One of the things that we can do, because this is again about science for social change, is looking at addiction for what it is. It's an illness. Those that are addicted, um, in fact, they found that about 66% of the US homeless uh, population suffers from substance abuse. So that guy on the street that might appear crazy, he's probably hurting. And he, he's not necessarily a criminal. He's probably going through a lot of pain. Um, those that are in prison, a lot of them probably got there because of um, maybe things that they did in regards to their addiction, um, stealing, um, illicit behavior. So now that we've talked about properly diagnosing and, and treating addiction, uh, how can this really promote social change? You know, one person at a time getting sober, what does it really matter? Well, let's look at the bigger picture, okay? 66% of the U.S. population that is homeless is thought to suffer from substance abuse, 66%. Those people, if they were treated in, in, in facilities or at least maybe uh, their alcoholism was treated differently before they even got to the point of being homeless, they wouldn't be there. Um, the prison system is filled with those that are addicts. Um, those that are in mental health facilities a lot of times are suffering from addiction. So by looking at addiction at a totally different way, we might see a shift in a positive direction, uh, getting homeless off the streets, getting people out of prison, um, hopefully raising generations of kids that when they, we see signs of addiction, we don't punish them or throw them in jail, we treat them. Because that's the problem. When you, when you label addicts as criminals, I think we're missing the big picture. We're missing the picture that these are people that are hurting, that are suffering, that have something deeper underneath the surface than a need to get high or drunk or have lots of sex. Because again, that's addiction too. So by treating it and understanding it and understanding the science behind addiction, hopefully we are going to promote more tolerance and uh, a better way of treating those addicted. Thanks for watching. And guys, addiction is a super heavy topic, but it's very important that we understand what causes it and how to treat it. Let me know if you've had any experience with addiction and leave them in the comments below. You can be anonymous, it's okay. Subscribe to Test 2 Plus if you haven't already and be sure to check out yesterday's episode about addiction and what exactly causes addiction. And thanks again for watching.